Earlier this month, Val Hoyle was sworn in as the new commissioner of the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries. She took the job just days after the agency released a bombshell report with accusations of sexual harassment in the Oregon legislature and a lack of action by legislative leaders to protect employees. Hoyle joins us tonight to discuss the next steps after the report and her vision for the state agency in charge of protecting the rights of workers across the state. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Oregon is one of only four states that directly elects a labor commissioner. And for only the second time in the commission's 115 year history, a woman is heading up the bureau. Longtime Democratic lawmaker Val Hoyle. She promises to safeguard the rights of Oregon workers and stand up for the civil rights of all Oregonians. One of her bureau's first orders of business, though, is a report set in motion by her predecessor, Brad Avakian. That report concludes top lawmakers in the legislature didn't do enough to stop a culture of sexual harassment at the state capitol. Commissioner Hoyle is here to tell us how, under her leadership, Boley plans to follow up on the investigation, and she'll share with us her goals and priorities as the Bureau's new Labor Commissioner. Welcome to my guest, Labor Commissioner Val Hoyle. It's Hi. great to have you back here on Straight Talk. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here. The last time you were here, you were running for Secretary of State for the Democratic nomination. Brad Avakian won that race, Doesn't. and he later was defeated by Dennis Richardson, the Republican, in the general election. But now you're replacing Avakian as a labor commissioner. How does it feel to be the new head of the Bureau of Labor and Industries for Oregon? Um, it's, it's exciting and it's overwhelming. I mean, it is a, it's, it's a unique job in the United States. I think, as you said, we're one of four states that elect their labor commissioner. Um, but we are the only state in which the labor commissioner, in addition to overseeing the investigation enforcement of workplace rules and apprenticeships and technical assistance for business and understanding the law, um, also has oversees um, civil rights investigation and enforcement and also um, does some work in protecting people against um, housing discrimination, fair housing laws. So it's actually a very, very broad mission and as I am directly elected, I'm not responsive to a statewide elected official. In many states, the governor would appoint the labor commissioner. Um, but in our state, you know, I am accountable just to the people of the state of Oregon. And I think that is unique. And it also speaks to or Oregonians' values. What have the first few weeks on the job been like for you? Uh, busy, really overwhelming. I've, I've um, got to meet a lot of the staff, and they are... Um, just a tremendous group of people really dedicated to the mission. The majority of the staff are here in Portland. We have an office over on Oregon Street in the Lloyd District. And, um, you know, people come there to, if they, you want to file a, a complaint for civil rights or, you know, a, a wage and hour complaint or if you're a business that or, or a, a union that want to talk about prevailing wage or other things. So we have people that walk in and we have um, I've, I've been meeting the staff and trying to wrap my head around the job. And, you know, I, I want to give myself time to figure out what the job is. And I I bring a different set of experiences than the previous commissioner so um, you know he was a employment and civil rights lawyer and I come from a private sector background and also was a member of a union grew up in a union household so um, and both your father and grandfather were union, were union members union how will members? that affect how you approach the job um, well I think uh, those are the values that shape uh, those are the experiences that shape the values that I have I was also a union member I was a member of unite here when I was in college um, in Boston and um, I will unapologetically stand up to protect the rights of workers and people wh whose civil rights have, have been you know violated but I also spent 25 years in the private sector so I was um, you know worked in retail sales um, international and domestic sales management I was the chairperson of the Export Council of Oregon which is our federal advisory board on uh, international business uh, international trade for small business so I have a, a unique balance of both labor and business experience and I think that's why when I when I ran and I won in May 
I came in with the support of both business and labor. And, and, and I won in counties, not just the liberal and democratic counties and you know the metro area and Lane County, but I, I won Coos, Curry, Wasco County, Columbia County. So um, I ran as a commissioner for the entire state and that means everybody, so that's how I will approach it. It's a nonpartisan seat, and that's how I intend to approach it. We have a photo of you with your dad. I mentioned that he was a union member, but also really interestingly, yeah. he also won election in it, November to the New Hampshire State Legislature. You must be so proud of him. I am really proud of him. I was out there for election day, and, and I think that's a picture of us standing there at seven o'clock in the morning in the cold and the rain, and uh, I was telling them all about how with vote by mail, you don't have to stand in the cold and the rain and vote on election day. You could do this at the comfort of your kitchen table. So I was telling everybody about that, but I am very proud of him. He uh, ran in a contested race and um, flipped a seat and he is currently serving on the uh, labor committee in New Hampshire. He is 80 years old and he knocked on more doors than everybody else and he, he, he was the top vote getter There's a, in, in, in his ward and I'm incredibly proud of him. So now we talk back and forth about legislative ideas and what we're doing. Interesting, it's, he's it's, on the labor committee. Maybe yes. he'll also spearhead vote by mail. I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, I, I, I suggest that because I don't want to stand in the rain with his lawn signs anymore. It's, it's cold. So we talked about how you try to balance uh, labor and business. Do, yeah. Can businesses expect support from you? Absolutely. And uh, one of my priorities is to expand um, the technical assistance part of uh, the agency. Right now there's three divisions. There's civil rights, apprenticeship, and then wage and hour. And those are, you know, enforcement divisions and then apprenticeships covers apprenticeships. Um, technical assistance is a smaller part of the agency. But what I heard from businesses was that they really wanted to be able to approach the agency to get information about rules and have rulemaking happen in a timely fashion. So I would like to make the te technical assistance program a full division and I've, I, I plan to go to the legislature. I have support from the chambers and from the labor unions, from the Association of General Contractors, from, you know, across the political spectrum to have this happen because um, it's critical that if, you know, I'm not the 91st legislator, I'm not passing the laws, but we do the rulemaking and it is the responsibility of our agency to make sure that those rules um, are available to businesses so they know how to follow the law. So um, I, I've actually gotten great reception from the business community. I'm looking forward to working with them. Your swearing in was also significant for another reason. For the first time in the state's history, most of the statewide office holders who are elected are women. That's correct. Yourself, Ellen Rosenblum, the attorney general, and of course, Kate Brown as governor, yes. the treasurer and secretary of state are both men. And I think people saw you in, in the Capitol underneath a big mural of Oregon pioneers who were all men. So right. what do you think this shows and represents that the direction the state is headed in? You know, I, I think we're looking at moving towards having uh, our statewide elected officials look more like the people who they're representing. I mean, we, we certainly can do better in terms of having more diversity and people of color in elected office. Um, but the fact of the matter is we bring a different set of experiences. I'm a, you know, I'm a mother. I, I you know, grew up in a low income household. I know what it what it meant to, you know, have to figure out how to pay for daycare. I mean, my husband and I worked split shifts because we could afford for two hours of babysitting. I mean, I know what it means to have to balance paying rent and, you know, buying food. And those are the experiences that I bring to the table. And I think you, you talked about the, um, the findings, the uh, the hostile workplace environment findings that... Um, yeah, and that, I want to talk about that because that's yeah. one area where we haven't made the progress that we'd like to make. You're talking about the, the report done by that's, your predecessor. Right. He spearheaded it, Brad Avaki, in outlining sexual harassment in the state legislature. Now, you've recused yourself from handling the findings of the investigation. Why? Well, um, what I did was I came in and there is a process when there is a commissioner's complaint. And so Brad Avakian put forward a commissioner's complaint. Um, the commissioner is the complainant. And so therefore the deputy commissioner is the one that is the decision maker. And so we followed the same process that Brad Avakian did. So I am the complainant and my deputy, who is Duke Shepard, will be the one that's the decision maker. And so, um, but I, I, I do think that being a woman who has worked predominantly in male-dominated industries, having been 
in the Capitol, having been, you know, when I first got to the Capitol as a staff member in 2009, I had, you know, women pull me aside and tell me, you know, who not to get into an elevator alone with, as if it was my responsibility to not get harassed. So that and was the culture when that you was, were a lawmaker. Yeah, that was, that was, well, that was when I was a staffer in 2009. I do think that we've come a long way. However, the investigation found, you know, substantial uh, evidence that there is a hostile workplace environment. And, and the fact of the matter is what we really want and, and what I hope comes out of this process is that, you know, we have justice for the victims, accountability for the legislature, and real deterrence from having this ever happen again. And that's, that really is the focus. Um, and, and again, just to be clear, we're following the same process that we would follow for any employer. The legislature has reached out to um, ask that we go to mediation. We've brought in um, a, a third party mediator that, that both sides have agreed upon. Let's which, talk about that. Yeah. You call, is that called conciliation? Or, it is or called conciliation. So why go that way and not in the courts? Um, it is, uh, again, any employer that has, you know, this kind of sub substantial finding of, of evidence um, has the right to request conciliation or mediation. So this is the same process that we would use in any other employer. They've reached out if mediation works and we can agree on the terms and, and Duke Shepard, you know, will be that decision maker. Um, Great, and if not, then we move forward with prosecution. So this does not preclude prosecution down the road. It it doesn't. And again, I just I know I keep saying it because um, I, I there were a number of people and editorial boards that said, well, Val Hoyle is going to come in and she's going to squash this or she's going to do that. And so I, I'm being very very careful to make sure that we follow the process that we would for any other employer. Also in the mediation, we have invited the other aggrieved parties. So we have invited the interns that were affected who are represented by counsel. So we've invited their lawyers to the table, Senator Sarah Gelser's lawyer to the table. We have invited aggrieved parties so that everybody could be represented in this mediation. And again, having an open, clear, transparent process to have that outcome. Again, justice for the victims, accountability for the legislature. And, and the biggest thing I want is a deterrent from this happening, you know, to anyone else going forward. There has been criticism of the Avakian report that it left out key witnesses. Will your investigation go back and interview some of those people that weren't interviewed earlier? I think that's a matter of what happens in the in the mediation. Um, certainly, you know, we'd be open to looking at, you know, after this, looking at how the investigation happened, what went right, what went wrong, um, and uh, but at, at this point. Uh, we're going to go to mediation and um, hopefully come to terms that, that, that provide all those three things, you know, the justice, accountability, and deterrence. The report had concluded that legislative leaders at the top did little to stop physical and verbal harassment by a couple of lawmakers, despite knowing about it for years. How do you feel about that report's conclusion? You worked with a lot of these people. I think it would not be fair for me to comment on... Um, on how I feel about the outcome. What I can tell you is, as somebody who was in the Capitol and as a staff person who wasn't in a position of authority, um, having had to deal with these things, I wanna make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. I also have seen a significant change in the culture, and we do have a long way to go, but I think, you know, both you and I are of an age where, you know, in a workplace, you were told to just, you know, be quiet, take it. And, and you were the victim yeah. of harassment yourself as I was. a waitress I, at As a, a waitress, I had to file a harassment claim when I was 21, and it was difficult. And my many of my colleagues uh, did not want me to file that harassment because this person was a nice guy. But the manager said, I really need you to file this because nobody else will, and we can't stop him or do anything until you filed that. Now, luckily, I was a member of the union at the time, and so I did have union protection, but it was, it was really difficult. And it was difficult as a young woman to st stand up. So again, if we can put things in place to deter this from ever happening again, and, and that's what I would hope. Again, I'm not in, in the decision-making uh, position. That will be Duke Shepard. What, what I'm hoping comes from this mediation is going forward, there are, there are a means for, um, for 
victims or people who have concerns to, to, to be protected. And you report back to the public when you have Absolutely. an Absolutely. And we're going to be very transparent about this process. I think that that's, that's critical in order to maintain the trust of both the legislature, but more importantly to the people of the state of Oregon who elected me. Something interesting, uh, the shutdown actually has affected w what you're trying to do with the legislature. They were supposed to have some sexual harassment training, but that was postponed <laughs> that because of uh, the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was going to lead the training and they couldn't do it because of the shutdown. You know, here's the thing. I got elected to do a job. I show up to do a job. I expect our federal government to do the same. It's very, very frustrating. And, you know, we see every day people who, you know, I, I have to get on a plane in two weeks. And we have people that are protecting the security of our country, whether it's in the TSA or our Coast Guard, you know, which is so important here in Oregon. Um, and they're having to show up without being paid. And it is, um, I think it's unconscionable. Um, and it, and it, it, to me, feels like our president is out of touch with what it means to live paycheck to paycheck. And uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's frustrating, it's discouraging, and I don't think that's how our federal government is supposed to work. State Senate uh, President Peter Courtney said he thinks it's time that Oregon lawmakers step up and do something to help Oregonians that are affected yes. by the shutdown, thousands of Oregonians. Is there anything that your office could do? There really isn't, and uh, I, I you want to be clear that I plan in this office to stay in my lane and not try and do things that aren't within the mission of the office. But I did speak to Governor Kate Brown earlier today uh, about this very issue, and she said she is working on something, I mean, to make sure that these people can can get some kind of pay. I know the, um, in California, Governor, they're, they're, uh, governor has allowed these workers to collect unemployment and I think that that is something that our governor is pursuing as well. She is she is on it and again understands um, that if you work you know if, if you work hard and you show up that you should get a day's pay and um, she give you any time frame of when she might have something she to did reveal? not it was, it was it was a really quick call I said Governor Brown <laughs> this is terrible and this is what California is doing. She said, Val, we're already on it. I said, that's wonderful. I'm sure there's uh, people watching tonight will be happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, during your speech, you did talk about how Bully might be able to help with the current climate at the federal government. We'll talk about that after the break. Great. We're back in two minutes.